Welcome to English 430 and 560. These are the podcasts for Shakespeare's drama, produced by and starring Dr. Bill Dines. There are, of course, a number of ways to approach King Henry IV, Part I. Some read it as merely dry history, who did what to whom and when. Others have read it as a thinly veiled celebration of Elizabethan political policy. During the 16th century, the monarchy gradually consolidated a great deal of power, and Henry's defeat of the rebels of the North and the West reflects that centralization of influence. We can also read it as a theological commentary on Henry's sins as a usurper and tyrant. Having deposed the rightful king, which was depicted in Richard II, the new king now is being righteously punished by rebellion both within the court and within his own family. All of these approaches have their value, but I'm particularly interested in two others. One is an exploration of the play's open-ended investigation of the meaning of honor, while the other looks at the father-son relationships that have Prince Hal at their center. Scholars date the creation of this play to around, sometime around 1596-1597. We know that Shakespeare's son Hamnet died in August of 1596, and that a grant of arms, which permitted him to sign his name as Gentleman, was made to John Shakespeare, the playwright's father, in October of that same year, 1596. Now, I'm not arguing that the play is about either of these events in any specific way, but surely, during the summer and fall of 1596, William Shakespeare was thinking about the relationships between fathers and sons, and I imagine that those thoughts were not always pleasant or comfortable ones. It's interesting, then, that this play focuses upon a father and son, the king and the prince, who don't see one another on stage until the very middle of the plot, Act 3, Scene 2. That interview is painful and exciting, showcasing Henry's bitter disappointment in his son and Hal's resolve to redeem his past behavior. More on Hal's plans a bit later, but for now we're drawn to the anger and the frustration that makes the king blurt out in the opening scene of the play his disgust for the, quote, riot and dishonor that stained the brow of my young Harry, end quote. The king wishes that he could find proof that some fairy, Puck perhaps, had exchanged his own son for the more noble Harry Percy, the Hotspur of the North, who fulfills all of the contemporary ideals of masculine courage and royal nobility. Hotspur's own father, the Earl of Northumberland, was one of the principal figures in King Henry's rebellion against King Richard. And so these two, and Northumberland's brother Worcester, are now worried that the king, feeling obligated to them for his current position, will never entirely be able to trust them. After all, they overthrew a sitting king once. King Henry laments that his son Hal won't demonstrate the chivalry and honor appropriate to a prince. Similarly, Northumberland laments that his son Hotspur is too headstrong and impulsive to be entrusted with the subtle duties of leadership. Historically, Hotspur was roughly the same age as King Harry. So Shakespeare's manipulation of the historical record is clearly designed to underscore the parallelism at work here. There's a third father-son relationship to be considered here, and that's the friendship between Falstaff and Hal. Through the first half of the play, we never see Henry and Hal together, but we rarely see Falstaff and Hal apart. Their good-natured teasing and tricks demonstrate just how close these two men are. Like Henry, Falstaff reigns in his own court, the green world of the tavern, and his subjects revolve around his center of gravity, even as they plot against him. Yet consider Hal's soliloquy at the end of Act 1, Scene 2. He says, quote, Herein will I imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world, that when he please again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wondered at. End quote. Hal knows just how base and duplicitous Falstaff and his buddies are, and he knows 
that his association with them damages his reputation before his father and the nobility of the court, the very people with whom he will have to work once he becomes king himself. He knows all of this, but he's still hanging out with these guys. What's he up to? Thus, the father-son pattern of the play is inextricably linked to the motif of honor. The three principals, Falstaff, Hotspur, and Henry, each demonstrate a different model of honor. And of course, since everyone knows their British history, right, and knows that Howell grows up to be King Henry V, one of the most revered monarchs of the kingdom, the interest here lies in just what Howell learns from each of these models and how he applies that learning in practice. The distinctions among the three models are broad and easily drawn. Henry is the vile politician, an opportunistic maneuverer who banishes Worcester from court when the former ally's behavior becomes increasingly inappropriate. Henry finds Mortimer's capture by Glendower convenient. It was Mortimer whom Richard II had designated as his heir, after all. Henry's stratagem on the battlefield at Shrewsbury, to place other men on the field wearing the king's armor and coat of arms, is both expedient and shocking, a clear indication that good tactics and good honor don't necessarily go together. Hotspur, by contrast, is the perfect embodiment of old-fashioned chivalry. He'd fit right in at King Arthur's round table, wouldn't he? But he has a great deal of trouble coping with the more modern world. He honestly seems to believe that, quote, it were an easy leap to pluck bright honor from the pale-faced moon, end quote. And he will brook no insult to his reputation, especially not from that half-faced Bolingbroke. That's a pun. Get it? Brook? Bolingbroke? Shakespeare did it first. Upon learning that neither his father nor other allies can join him on the battlefield, Hotspur decides to go ahead with the battle anyway, arguing that their absence, quote, lends a luster and more great opinion to our great enterprise, end quote. Remember that line of reasoning, by the way. We'll revisit it again in King Henry V. An honorable death is more desirable than success for the Hotspur. Does he get what he wants? And then there's Falstaff. Drunkard, womanizer, liar, cheat, faithless leader. But he's an enormous amount of fun, arguably the greatest comic character Shakespeare invented for the stage. Backing up that claim would take a lot longer, a much longer argument than would be appropriate here. But at his heart, Falstaff is a creative egotist, a thoroughly unapologetic manipulator who reads the entire world through the lens of his own mirror. Yeah, I know that's an oddly mixed metaphor, but think about it for a minute, and I think you'll see that it's appropriate. Falstaff's concept of honor is wholly utilitarian and physical, and his soliloquy at the end of Act 5, Scene 1, demands our attention. Like Hotspur, Falstaff recognizes the value of honor, and like King Henry, realizes that it can be manipulated. Unlike those two, however, Falstaff does not believe that honor is a goal worth all the work that it takes to acquire and maintain, since it's controlled by public opinion rather than housed in the internal self. Therefore, he just discards it and embraces a very different fate than Hotspur does. Prince Hal's brilliance, then, is his ability to perceive the differences between these three men, to synthesize their wildly different models, and to create a new model whose final fruition isn't really obvious until Henry V. Like Hotspur, Hal realizes that chivalry and honor are vital elements of an effective leader. Like his father, Hal recognizes the performative nature of honor, and so his behavior throughout the entire play is based on his awareness of his various audiences. Like Falstaff, Hal understands that honor is not intrinsic to the self, but a matter of the perception of others. The result is a cynical and manipulative young man, capable of betraying friends and risking a kingdom. But the result is also victory and stability. We can never forget that Hal's personal success is intimately connected with that of his country. And even though we suspect he enjoys the power he's manipulating, we recognize that he wields that power 
for the sake of the community whose king he's planning to be. But that's another play. While this play, then, begins and ends with its titular character, its star and center is the prince. Yet another way to read the play is as a Bildungsroman, the story of a young man passing through various educational experiences to emerge a wiser, more mature soul at the end. But don't forget that soliloquy at the end of Act 1, Scene 2, and read with care Howell's defense of himself before his father in Act 3, Scene 2. I think that this is a young man who knows all along what he's doing and why he's doing it. The son has already learned a great deal from both of his fathers and is now putting that education into action. 